Welcome everyone to the data science hangout. Welcome back to all the familiar faces. I think most everybody's been on here at least once, um, but also welcome to those joining for the first time. Thank you, Rob, for covering for me last week while I was out on vacation. Yeah, but for today's episode, um, or just to kind of level set on the data science hangout as well for, for people who are, are new to this. These discussions on data science leadership in the enterprise range from very human oriented topics to a little bit of technical talk, but really focusing on questions that are most important to you all. So there's no agenda, please join in live or put any questions that you have in the chat. Um, but with that said, I'd like to just jump in here and enjoy introduce Tori Oblad. Enterprise Data and Analytics Officer at Wafed Bank. Tori Thank is extremely passionate about training and building community. So I'm super excited to talk a bit more about that today too. Tori, would you be able to kick things off by introducing yourself and maybe sharing a bit about the work you do on your team? Sure. Um, so for background, I have degrees in econ and math. Um, I've been doing data science professionally for about 20 years in healthcare and in banking. I'm currently working at Wafed Bank where I'm actually starting the data science program there. So. Awesome. Um, so I know we have these kind of standard questions that we kick things off with until people start jumping in with questions. Um, so one that I'd love to ask you is, what are you really excited about right now with data science? Um, this isn't totally new, new, but I'm really, when I first started, I was in SAS and that's not very accessible. So over the years, it's been fun to see the accessibility, not just of tools, but really of data science being able to be shared with people. I'm now having conversations with people where they're starting to want to learn and you couldn't like take SAS to your house and learn it. But right now, currently at work, one of the things I'm instituting is having R as a standard. So anybody in the company that actually wants to do it can start learning. I'm not quite there, but <laughs> we're close. Oh. That's something I'm super interested in because it, a lot of people will uh, ask me about how they start their own internal use R group or build their data science community. Um, and I'm curious what is starting to, or what has worked well for you, or what are you doing to try and start to build this? Um, what I found the most useful is, is really time expensive, but starting with a few key people and areas that want to learn something, working with them one-on-one -on, -one on something very, if I can fix or help them fix, help them figure out how to fix their problem. So it has to be, something that affects them. Otherwise, it, it goes away. They forget what they've learned. Um, starting that community where it's one-on-one, -on -one, hands-on training, like what, what are the issues? OK, how do you think you should go about it? If there, when you can find those key people that are excited, they will actually start learning. And they become these internal, wow, this is really exciting. And it's more credible to hear from somebody that is not a data scientist or super programmer that's scarier, that you can do it. So I found that is really helpful to have like resident, um, whether they were Excel users or whatever type of more beginner analyst to help internally a community. Data science community is a little different. Um, I can talk about that too, because I think that's fun. So I don't know uh, if people are more in companies where you have a central data science or if you're more distributed. Mm -hmm. what, what do people live in? I don't know. Yeah, feel free guys to so quiet. Feel free to weigh in in the, <laughs> the chat or, or speak live too. Um, but I know what I've heard from some people um, lately is, like, how do you actually find those people that would want to learn or like the super uh, Excel power users that could maybe benefit from using a tool like R or Python? Because um, mm -hmm. I think, like you said, they may not have that data science title. So how right. do you go about like finding all of those people? So one thing um, <clears throat> I've found very helpful is 
just for data science in general to be successful is to partner with the, the business. And generally your business users are not programmers. Yeah. But it, a lot of that communication where, okay, we have an objective that we're trying to meet through those discussions, generally you'll find small bits of, oh, well, how are you going about that? Maybe we can tackle that in a different way. So it turns into a lot of small side projects, but it's those, those relationships that you're making for the bigger data science issues that you find the small guys that need help. Mm -hmm. I'd love to chime in here. I um, At my company, uh, what I found to be very helpful is uh, leading little learning cohorts. And I really focus on EDA because our, our studio is awesome for exploratory data analysis. So I can create these little cohorts, some business analysts in there who work in, let's say, inventory management or transportation, pair them up with people working, right, who would you say are more technical data analysis um, roles. And if you can get them learning together on a cadence, right, they form the relationships, they understand each other's problems, and they learn R at the same time. And then once you write any Excel user who discovers R, it's unlikely that they're going to say, wait, I'm going to only use Excel from now on. Yep. So, yeah. That's great. And Frank, if you feel comfortable doing so, it'd be great to introduce yourself as well <laughs> to the group. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd love to. Um, I'm really glad to be here. This is my, my first session. Um, I work at Target. I live out in Minnesota. Uh, my whole life, I've been on the coast, either up in uh, New York, Boston, New Jersey, or in San Francisco. For the past three years, I came to work with Target uh, in there. So I came to build, let's say, a hybrid um, business intelligence team. So when I came here, we weren't necessarily calling ourselves business intelligence or analytics or any of that. We called ourselves transportation performance to distinguish our, ourselves. And really, it's a um, I built teams of um, pretty good uh, Python and R users. Taught any, anyone who didn't know that, right? And I taught them R first because I think R is a great introduction. And then if they want to do more machine learning, NLP stuff, they get into Python. Uh, but for the past three years, I've been building teams that really sit in the middle of the business and then being able to do data analysis at a, a pretty rapid rate. Um, I lead a team now that I call decision intelligence. Uh, it's a little bit of a, a branding strategy on my part, but I need my stakeholders to be thinking about the decisions. So when they say, hey, what do you do? What is your team doing? I say, well, we start with the decisions you're making and the actions you're taking, and then we can find the analytics to support that. Um, so that's what I do now. I lead a team, mostly support transportation within the supply chain of Target. Um, but I'd say my passion in Target is teaching people, especially Excel, like heavy Excel users, how to get to the, the next step of what I call higher powered um, data analytics. Awesome. Thanks for joining, Frank. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, Frank, you brought up a really good point. Something I found very useful when you start having a community, even if it's just a data scientist and you don't know who is interested in learning R or even what data science is, is creating more of a, it has to be organic or it doesn't really work, but having those more of like lunch and learns where it's, hey, invite your friends. Because I think people forget how powerful their networks are. And like you invite this friend who has another friend and um, so I'm new to this position. These are, I, we, I'm still building that internal community from where I came from. It's interesting because we had a few data scientist groups throughout the, the bank and over just a few weeks where people would come and say, hey, this is the cool thing I'm learning. We started getting in compliance humans, which do not speak computer. So it, it was exciting where the understanding of even what is what is possible out there really started to spread organically with people you wouldn't even expect. So that was that was awesome. So don't forget your friends and your friends' friends. They are it is a very powerful and good way to create that organic growth of information and knowledge. And for the the lunch and learns that you do, is that something that's weekly or monthly? So we started out, um, I think quarterly, but then people were really interested and they wanted to actually show, oh, I'm actually working on this thing and it, it relates to this other person's thing. So we started doing it 
not quite every other week. That's a lot. I think we're doing it about every three weeks. Nice. So yeah, I, th informal. I feel like that, can, that consistency probably really helps too. Yeah. It was interesting too. Um, something that started to happen, it started out more data science heavy, but what I thought was useful is so a lot of data scientists, you know, we love to talk about the nerdy geeky stuff and it turned into not just algorithms, but more context where people are getting a good audience of practicing for your, who you really need to be talking to, to get buy-in, like your executives, they're not going to totally care about your algorithms, unfortunately. Understanding how to speak to that broader audience. It, it became fun for people though, because it was, okay, this is this neat thing that, that I'm doing, why I'm doing it and how it works. Let me explain it in layman's terms. Then um, what was also nice is people from other parts of the bank that weren't in data science, but the, the girl that was running up ads, she had no background in it. So she explained how her job worked, what it worked, like how she, basically how optimization of Google works. And she started working with one of the data scientists to make it better, which I don't think would have happened without that internal community, which is awesome, so. That is, that's great. I don't want to leave this topic yet, if that's okay with, with everyone, because I see there's a lot of great comments in the, the chat window too. And I was wondering if um, maybe Sep, if you wanted to weigh in with, with your experience here too. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Sep. Um, I'm sure we'll get to know each other more over the, over the weeks. Uh, I find this uh, a very interesting uh, forum just to kind of see how people in different industries even um, are, are uh, impacting their, their organizations. Um, I, I think for me, uh, being in kind of healthcare and healthcare tangent kind of organizations, which in general, stereotypically are not very um, uh, technical forward sometimes, um, I find uh, explaining a lot of or showing a lot of like the art of the possible to be kind of a fun, uh, a fun exercise. Um, and I, I see Rick's comment, I, and I totally agree. I, I don't like to just do necessarily flashy, but just to kind of to say, hey, look, there's there's some efficiency gains that could be that could be made if we kind of do things this way. So that's kind of just the comment I want to kind of make there. Yeah, I think, I think too the flashy, even the simple, what what generally we think is really simple, most people don't realize how easy it is to get a data set and play with it and make it easy. Like the, the horrible manual processes that people go through, like none of us would do that anymore, but it's everywhere. And like fixing that, like they go into Excel and manually changing things every single month, like just revealing that that is not something you have to do ever again. The, is, the, is mind blowing. The funny, funny uh, example that I always give is because my name is Sep. If you put Sep in Excel, it renders to September, um, and uh, and I find it annoying, and it, and it's another reason I just hate Excel. Um, but uh, but I always kind of show that example is that if you're going to be dealing with names, and you get a name like mine, and Excel renders it to September, and then you go export that, and someone's dealing with it, um, it ends up being causing these kind of uh, issues because it's trying to make it easy for you. But I use that example all the time. It's a pretty funny one. Eric, I see you had a question around um, fostering that internal community. Do you want to ask that one live? Sure. Um, so great to be here. Um, for those that don't know, my name is Eric. I'm in the life sciences industry and quite a passionate R user in my various endeavors. Um, but my question is a bit loaded. I don't know if others or um, others have experience with this, but I lead an internal R form at my company, and it's very well attended. Everybody seems to enjoy it, and I try my best to let others feel like be comfortable sharing the cool things they're doing with R, because we know R is being more prevalent in our company and across um, life sciences in general. But I don't know if it's just me. I just get a hard, I have a hard time getting others to lead topics. It tends to fall on me or some of the other, what I'll call the uh, established uh, power users, if you will. So I don't know if you had advice on fostering that engagement of everybody feeling 
feeling comfortable to kind of share their their wins with R, you know, cool things they're doing, even if they just have questions. It, it's a bit loaded, but I don't know if you had any advice on making people feel comfortable to present their work at a forum like that. It's hard. Yes, it's really I hard. Found out the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> I found um, I've had to spend a lot of time one on one with the person and just be like, you know, I, we're planning to present this. Would you be part of that? If you need any help prepping, I would love that. But it'd be so great to debut your work because mm -hmm. X, Y, Z, it's relevant in this way, which people haven't seen or they could relate to you, but it, it's time expensive. Training and, and getting people on board anyway is super time expensive. Unless somebody's found a magic pill. <laughs> I've been looking for a long time. I have not found yeah. it yet. Um, the training piece is even harder than just the community piece of it, in my yeah. humble opinion. Um, I do have some people helping me with the forum I lead, which is very helpful. We try to reach out to certain people, but yeah, I just was hoping I could get more kind of people coming to us and saying, hey, you know, I had this great idea or, you know, I, I just don't get that as much. And I'm trying to figure out ways of incentivizing that a bit, but I'll, so, I'll keep searching if you want. The only <laughs> um, thing that I found is helpful is I haven't, like what I've done so far hasn't been restricted to a specific topic sure. at all. Okay. So you're not required to do R or something amazing. It's more of we just want to share something interesting with each other that might mm -hmm. benefit that that's helpful because it's less stress. That's a great point. Yeah, thank you. Something that's um, helped me with the Boston use our group is um, if I can't find a speaker, sometimes I'll make it a series of lightning talks and so have very short okay. presentations that people will give and people seem to feel a lot more comfortable with that, especially if it's their first one. Um, and I think that's a much easier ask to someone than saying, like, lead this 45 minute session. Yeah, that's a great point. I'll keep that in mind. Thank you. Hi, my name is Edgar. I work uh, with Daimler Trucks. Um, happy to be here and enjoy the forum too. Um, I was going to share, Eric, what we've done in our company um, is kind of phrase it as what gap have you mastered lately? Right. What what have what got and, and then that gets people talking from a I learned standpoint versus I don't know how to do this standpoint. Uh, that, that's that's one approach. And then the other approach is we just rotate who facilitates the meeting. And that tends to take different interests. Uh, sometimes people have a very concise problem they want to fix or a or a, a, a way to go about something that's not available, whether it is IT is not permitting it or the software doesn't do it. Um, and then it becomes that uh, kind of self-guided type of conversation, but definitely um, something along the lines of what gap have you mastered lately? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, thank you for sharing that here. Yeah, happy to do so. Maybe I can uh, chime in on the um, how to get people to show their, their stuff for Eric. Uh, so I'm Rick. I also work in the life sciences, and I, I work a lot with uh, researchers that are, are doing, and I, I do a lot of training in R. Like 90% of my work is, is doing training and teaching and mentoring and all variety of different capacities. And um, one thing that I've done a lot is to uh, get them more, be more comfortable discussing and showing their work because a lot of things that a lot of, there's a lot of hurdles for new starters in any topic to get over is that it's not perfect and it's not the right way. So they don't, they're a little bit embarrassed to show their, their, their stuff. Um, so to help them get over that, what I'll do is um, I've, done this, I've done this in person and now it's, it's easier that I, now I do things all online is that I get them to share their screen or I, I, I get them to explain what they're doing. So if I, if I give them an exercise and um, I would just ask them like how they solved the exercise and I don't miss maybe something that a lot of pedagogical people disagree with. I, I don't give them really simple questions that have a really nice, easy, clear answer. I give them an example that has the answer and I say, okay, do it. And it's amazing how many times people just don't do exactly what's an example. So they start trying all kinds of weird and wacky things. I'm like, okay, fine, just do it. I don't say, go and look at that example and do it. So they start doing weird things. And I say, okay, how did you do this? And then they describe it to me and then I'll type it out or I'll get them to share their screen if I can't, uh, if, if, I, if it's possible. And then other people see what they're doing. Um, so that also kind of helps, helps them work. And then what I did in the, in the workshops I would usually do with researchers is they would have time to do their own analysis. 
And then at the end of the workshop, I would be looking at what they're doing. And if I saw somebody that had like a really, really cool example or really made some nice progress, I would say, hey, do you want to take five minutes and show everybody this stuff at the end of the class? And then I would help them and I would, we would kind of be like co-presenters and uh, we would present it together. And then I would say, oh, look what this person did over here. And then I could go on the computer and I can type and things like that. And then I, I was kind of like their co-pilot in doing that. Uh, so that seemed to, to help them a lot. And then they would be a little, little bit less, um, less uh, uh, self-conscious about it. And then the third thing that I do is um, I would have them, they would, they would just ask me questions. Like I would go around and say, okay, like what is your project? What are you working on? And then they would say things like, is it, is it possible to read in like several files? And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, it's, not, it's not a problem. You can read thousands of files, no problem. And they're like, wow, okay, like, like how? And then, I, and then uh, I would say, okay, well, you know, let's, let's try and figure it out. And then I would present it to the class. And then that would give me a chance to explain deeper all the problems with that, with that topic and things you need to watch out for. And then they would be very much engaged because they'd be like, oh, I, I really see the usefulness of this activity inside. Me. So all those things I think help to have them, to get them be a little bit easier to present. Oh, that's very nice, Rick. There are lots of good nuggets there. Um, we definitely have tried like having like certain themes throughout the year of like maybe we're going to talk more about our markdown or we're going to talk more about interacting with databases and stuff like that. But I kind of see your point. If you get them actively working on something and don't hold their hand, but let them be a little more innovative and a little more creative, then you can glean some nuggets from that too. So yeah, that's very cool. Thank you, Rick. I I feel like that kind of leads into one of the questions that Hugh asked as well um, around uh, like helping new R users power through the initial learning curve. Hugh, do you want to provide any more context on that question? Sure. Uh, my name's Hugh Welch. Um, I, this is my third time on these calls and my first time uh, interacting. Uh, I'm a management analyst with Veteran Health Administration. Uh, I've been using R for the last couple of years to build uh, informatics products. And we've been getting a lot of interest in those uh, and people uh, around different facilities wanting to kind of replicate some of that. Like, that's cool. How do I get into R? Um, and I kind of feel like, you know, it's uh, okay, well, here's two books, uh, a couple data camp courses, uh, vignettes on all the tidyverse packages, read through these, and, and then we can, uh, you know, we can start talking about what to do. Um, so it's been kind of difficult getting people who uh, some of whom have some programming background, maybe, you know, they've done some visual basic or they've done uh, familiar with SQL or familiar with some stuff, but a lot of them are just uh, power Excel users and kind of getting them through that uh, mental shift into uh, there's a different way of thinking about this um, has been, <laughs> been an area that's been pretty difficult. Um, I've noticed remote is harder for me to get people into it because I used to just go to somebody's desk and sit down next to them and talk through even getting it R on your computer, setting it up and doing simple things initially, because then the person is set up, they know these simple things they can get into. But without the, so what I've now started doing is doing a lot of screen sharing. I can't remember who brought that up, but screen sharing where you can interact, at least if you can't type on each other's, you can, either have the person watch you for a while and then have them do something so that after you hang up, they can at least refer back to that you went over. But if I don't do that, if I'm just like, hey, go walk this tutorial, it doesn't go anywhere. I've noticed like there has to be some initial, I can do this on my own when somebody's not holding my hand. And then people are comfortable going to different resources. And it has to be absolutely applicable to their daily life or they're not going to do it. And <laughs> definitely <laughs> finding that practical application is uh, sometimes challenging, especially with new people who want to do something really complicated. Like let's start with, <laughs> let's start with this very simple problem and get you some, you know, do some EDA on it, do some basic aggregation, pull in some files. You know, we're not going <laughs> to, we're not going to build a model like, in the first 10 minutes that tells you what you need to know. So, yeah. But thank you. I was thinking actually about putting together maybe some company R markdowns with some very simple applicable to broad um, areas. So, you know, we're pulling in data. Well, it's generally Excel. So make that simple for them to swap out what data. And we want to graph it, make it very simple, just so they have little snippets of code that 
it's super simple if you played in R, but if when you're new, you're like, what is GG Ponzi? <laughs> what are my inputs? And it's overwhelming. So people just stop. Mm. So just making it, okay, I'm going to make you feel powerful and make something beautiful from a very simple script that you can run on your own. I should probably actually do that, not think about it. Yeah, and you know, I just finished a master's in analytics and, and some of the professors had great primers on where to start because the backgrounds are very. So establishing difference between R and R Studio and your R Studio libraries and how powerful R Studio is, I mean, you immediately fall in love with it. But the cool thing is, you know, the primer includes things to, um, to the effect of create a folder, put this file in Excel in it, you'll read it with this script, but then go open it and check out what you did because you're going to edit via R Studio, and 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 that just not only builds kind of the mental model of how things work, but also the trust on your new interface. So that that really worked well for us. Well, for me as a student, that is. It's funny trying to like imagine if we were all in person right now, and so I take the signal of unmuting as thinking maybe somebody's about to speak so i was wondering if frank if you wanted to add anything to yeah uh following off what what tori was saying i i feel as though i've had good success writing starter scripts for people um just taking a bit so uh we are lucky at target to have both um a, an awesome package uh called bullseye connect written by this guy alex meyer that connects to all our databases so right you install the package and then you get it you you connect it to any database basically in, in the company. Uh, so that's one. And then the second thing that's been huge is we have um, hosted our studio and hosted Jupyter Notebooks. So all you do is go to a link and then say like, start a new instance of our studio, right? Just like if you were doing it on Kaggle, but we have it for Target. So you're on our VPN and um, you can access the data. So that has been huge. And it makes it very easy for me. If someone is interested in R, then say, hey, what data do you use most often? Okay, let's find your, your um, data source and then basically just build a script that's what, 20, 30 lines of code and go through, read in the data, maybe do a tiny bit of cleaning, aggregate it, build a cool visualization with Plotly and write um, immediately they're like, oh, this is cool. And then you can change one or two fields and say like, you have an awesome facet plot here, change one field, and now you have something completely different and you're seeing your data in a way that you've never seen it before. Um, you can get people to that really fast. Uh, and some people will stick with it. Some people will be like, this is great. I'm gonna use this insight and I'm never coming back to this again. Some people <laughs> are, are gonna go with it, but then the, right, the, the cost of doing that and building those starter scripts individually is really low because we have the right tools um, so you can find out who is actually like the level of engagement for different users. It, it doesn't, doesn't really matter the, the portion of them that fall off versus the portion that adopts it because the portion that adopts it will then, I think, go on to become uh, evangelizers. So Thank you. That's, don't that's discount really the, sorry. Oh, sorry. Don't, no, don't discount ahead. the people that don't um, use it though, because at least they know what's possible and those people can become very good evangelizers. Like knowing the possible know is, <laughs> yeah, they, they're like, oh, wait, I know if you talk to so-and-so, you can actually solve this problem. Mm -hmm. That is a big cohort because a lot of people are not going to, they're not going to keep going. It's just how it is. They're still, it's still not a waste of your time. So don't, don't get too discouraged. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Again, you, I yeah, interrupted not. you. No, you're good. I was just going to say thank you to Frank. I really like that idea of, uh, doing some of the grunt work for them to make it really easy to, to grab some stuff and get some immediate uh, results so that they can kind of engage quickly. And then if they're interested, uh, figure out how it actually works so they can do it themselves and break it apart and, you know, make and it they, And they will, there'll be plenty of those people, right? That run with and think this is amazing. And yeah, then they start doing it every day. Yeah, because it's it, some of that, you know, setup stuff scares a lot of people away because they see, oh, code and connections, and I don't know what this means. I'm just going to, you know, <laughs> I, I'm going to move on. <laughs> yeah, the, what was that called? Bullseye Connect. That's actually the first package I wrote here because I was like, things get, people get stuck on connecting to the data and you can't do anything without that connection. So others don't have that internal thing that I think is absolutely key can't get to the data they're kind of they're kind of stuck and they're not not going to get out of excel because they don't have access to anything else that's a great point 
Oh, it sounded like someone was about to say something. If I if I can jump jump in, I, I uh, completely agree with the uh, the starter script uh, package or the idea of having the starter scripts. Um, and I think one one thing that I add on top of that is that um, is helping them to a, a lot of the really like people that never did anything programmatic or command line tools or any any typing in a terminal or anything, they just don't get the. The, they don't have the mental model. Somebody mentioned this idea of the, the mental model. I think that's really important. Um, not just in terms of the algorithms, but also like how this thing fits together, right? So they don't appreciate that um, self-referential functions that change the input, that you can't run them twice, right? Like if I do a, a log 10 of a variable, I can't run that function again because I'm going to get error messages. And then they freak out. It's like, well, why did I get error messages? And I'm like, well, because you did the log 10 of a log 10. And like that, they don't, they don't get that. They don't see why that's a weird thing. They don't see that they can replace a variable and they don't get a warning message that they replace it. So what I do is, um, I think one, one nice thing is to try and help them to build up the whole workflow. Now you're not just supposed to build the whole workflow from top to bottom. So if you have a, a, a solution in Excel that they've already done, and this comes back to the other idea, right? Like how do you make it relevant for them? Um, that script is gonna be based on something that's really relevant, a project that they're working on or some idea. And you have this, this solution in Excel. And the one I like to do is qPCR because scientists love this technique and there's no clear standardized way to analyze the results because every different system is a complete mess and everybody's spending a lot of time doing their analysis on qPCR. So they have their, their terrible solution in, in Excel and SPSS and GraphPy Prism and things like this. And then I say, okay, so let's write basically just like pseudocode. Like what do we need to do? We need to calculate this, we need to calculate this and we need to calculate this and we need to make this plot. And then they have a hard time sometimes telling me like what they want to do. And then there's communications issues. And I get to talk to them about how they need to describe what they're talking about and how when they say something like, I need to take the mean of the weight. And so, and then they'll, they'll take the mean of, um, the, I want, I want the, the mean of each group. They'll do like that, right? So they'll I'll take the mean and then inside the brackets, they'll put the, the grouping variable. And I'm like, like colloquially, when we say take the mean of each group, we know what we mean. We mean to take, take the weight according to each of the group variables, but that's not how we have to type it. So they type literally how they think. And then all these kinds of discussions help them to kind of see in their head this conversion from what they do in Excel into, into R. So then we build like the pseudocode piece by piece by piece. And then they can basically fill in the blanks of all the commands and they can see all the different steps. And then in doing that, I also tell them, um, if you can't get one part, don't worry about it because the analysis part here is separate from the visualization part and it's separate from this part down here. So if you, if you get stuck on that part, just do what you can and just leave it and then go to the visualization. And if you, if you get stuck there, then go back to the analysis and then go to this part here. So you don't have to do one piece to get to, get to the next part and you can kind of go back and see, I had no, know the general idea then can then fill it out um, in, in the end. And I think those kind of things help. Thank you, Rick. I, I see Steven asked a question that kind of revolves around this conversation as well. Um, Steven, would you want to introduce yourself and ask that question? Yeah, um, absolutely. This is the first Hangout I've joined, so this is kind of cool. Um, I, I started in SAS and I moved to R and I learned that it is not as simple as like, oh, just check out this vignette and go do that. And I want, I, I really resonate with what he was saying. It's like, uh, go take this specialization in Coursera and come back and we'll talk like six months later or something. I'm trying to find the right level of data literacy to build in, in our company. I'm comfortable with R and R Markdown. I have a senior statistician who is, but for those junior members, I wanna enable them to get out of Excel. I even wanna enable them to just do simple things like pivot tables. So I'm trying to figure out like, does it make sense to really uh, invest in having them learn R over six months to a year? Or, you know, we're talk we talk a lot about these dashboards and interactive things. There there's middle grounds, I, I think, to take. Um, I guess my comment, or, or maybe I'm curious what you guys have done in finding like which people are, are the right ones to just make them like pivot table masters versus those who should really be spending time to learn R and, and know how to code things ground up. It really depends on the person's interest, yeah. right? Um, I've noticed some people just are not interested at all. They, they see that Excel is their thing. And so um, there are a couple people I've been working with lately that fall into this category. And so I have gone through Excel with them to try to at least make it a little more efficient, but it still wasn't doing what we were doing. So on the side, 
I did something in R for them and have like this little dashboard that they can go interact with the data. And one of the guys is like, oh, this is way better. You know, I actually, I, I can actually learn some things. And, and it, it was interesting after spending a couple months with him in Excel and then just being like, can you play with this? Cause I can't get it to work exactly in Excel the way I want. Does this work for you? And he, at that point, after we, we've struggled together forever, he's like, wow, okay, maybe I will try. So it, it seems really person to person and interest level. I don't know, like you mentioned learning Tableau, Power BI. Um, a lot of particularly management doesn't seem to, well, actually a lot of people don't understand the difference between why you'd want a full blown like, programming language versus say a Power BI or Tableau. And if the data is great, sure they can, they can use Power BI, but if it's not good, they're gonna struggle to death if they wanna do anything that's not out of the box. Uh, I went down that path, I, I don't know, maybe five years ago. And I was like, nope, I am not gonna train people on Tableau and Power BI. It's, it's too much to take on in addition. Plus I think most of the problems have to do, they run into data issues. Anybody else have thoughts? Well, I, I was gonna say, um do one of these. And <laughs> but when I when I started introducing Ardo, a lot of the, the management at, at Target uh, and supply chain, they were like, what do you mean it's free? I'm like, it's open source, it's <laughs> just use it. <laughs> um, but uh, going back to um, Excel in particular, I, um, even my team of analysts, I encourage them build toy models in Excel, right? If you can think through the idea in Excel, you're going to be able to easily explain it to people. So I'm a huge proponent of starting that way um, for both business analysts, operators, data analysts, because it's so fast. And if you can build a toy model in Excel, then you can say, okay, we want to do even quicker, or we want to do this at a higher, uh, a, a higher scale. Then you move over to the R world. Um, really quick example. Again, I work in supply chain. Uh, we are trying to figure out how do trucks move around our yards and when are they gonna get too full? Uh, I built the first thing in Excel because it was super easy to explain to everybody how I was thinking about it, the information that I didn't have. And once everyone said, yeah, it looks like it, it gets pretty close to the answer we're looking for, it helps us make decisions. Then I said, okay, great, this is for 1DC. I need to do it for 25, not creating 25 spreadsheets, right? Then I just put the, the logic in R and I was able to do it right pretty, pretty darn quickly for all of our distribution centers. Yeah, I think people knock Excel. It's a, it is a great prototyping tool and it allows for that communication with the business where they're not, a lot of people aren't gonna learn your code, but they will go through an Excel workbook. So like it is a useful tool that um, helps with communication and building that relationship with the business. And we don't want to use it, but what? <laughs> I'll meet them where they are. Right? Yeah, exactly. Are. So I love this. Discussion. I was just going to be quiet for the rest of the time, but I've actually been down this exact road with Tableau and Power BI <laughs> for the last few years. <laughs> Um, VHA had an enterprise contract with Tableau a few years ago, and we developed uh, significantly there, thinking that was going to be the future. And then two years ago, uh, they decided they're going to cut the contract and go to all Microsoft. And they said, we're going to migrate to Power BI. I'm like, that's, it's not a migration if I can't take my work with me. <laughs> and so uh, we found that uh, we were suddenly tasked with redeveloping so many things that we'd built over the last several years. Uh, we started looking around to see what were some other options. And that's why we, uh, we started to go down the R path. Um, the ability to be platform agnostic from my perspective uh, over the last couple of years has been invaluable to know that uh, there's talk of contract shifts again here coming uh, for the federal government and knowing that no matter what happens, uh, I can take my work with me and I don't have to keep rebuilding things and I can uh, give somebody the code to reproduce and repeat it uh, without having to explain all the data transformations uh, and how the, the calculations interact uh, has been just invaluable. So, 
Good point. That's a that's another thing I keep evangelizing specifically to. A lot of banking um, heavily relies on vendors, and often um, I know other industries do too. But it it feels worse in banking than it even was in healthcare, where proprietary software it comes with support and like you're but you're putting yourself in vendor lock-in and you end up having to try to figure out what's going on and you have no idea so I agree with you 100% here like to be technology agnostic is is what you want you and Tori with I mean with both the industries that you work in I I'd love to cover David's question really around compliance David, would you be able to introduce yourself and, and your role and ask that question? Yeah, sure. I'll be happy to. So uh, my name is David Dreyer. I'm a technical expert at, at Syngenta Crop Protection. Um, so yeah, we work in a, a pretty regulated environment um, in the pesticide industry. And as a result, you know, we have compliance with what are called good laboratory standards. So we have to, you know, kind of understand the, the data from, you know, cradle to decision, essentially. And, you know, with a lot of these guideline studies, um, they rely on kind of black box methods for data analysis and system statistics. But, you know, I so see there's a lot of opportunity here to potentially use some of the, you know, open source, you know, software to, you know, improve essentially the analysis, transparency, et cetera, of our studies. And so I'm just curious. I mean, obviously, you work in a very different industry, but um, still compliance is, is common. So I'm kind of interested in how you manage those relationships and if you could tell us a little bit more about that. So um, in my experience, if I cannot explain my models, compliance isn't going to go for it. Unless it's from like marketing, you have a lot more leeway and, and then you, I'm not sure people call what they're doing as modeling, but within modeling and particularly in banking, if you do not have good explainability, at least none of my compliance people or auditors are okay with it. So I, sorry, I wish I had a better answer. Huge. Is it huge? Well, I was going to say, uh, working in healthcare, um, you're right. Explainability, uh, the ability to kind of backtrace your whatever you've done and show your work has is a requirement. I um, mean, there's uh, there's regulations out there that you have to be able to show somebody, uh, you know, why the algorithm picked whatever it picked for them. Uh, my use here has been pretty niche. It's mostly operations, uh, and it's not very widespread. Uh, which is kind of why I asked about the, you know, getting new users on board because they're starting to see that, you know, the value in it. Um, but we have to be incredibly careful that uh, everything we do is approved by our IT uh, and that we're incredibly uh, careful with what we, uh, what we do with our data because it's not our data. Um, so uh, we are very thoughtful with every step, step of the process to make sure that we're in compliance with all the rules and regulations and uh, bureaucracy. But um, most of what we do is we're not uh, building black box models that, you know, I can't tell you why this neural network split, spit out this answer. Um, what I'm more trying to do is tell you how many patients are going to be here tomorrow and where are they going to be and what's their cancel likely cancellation rate so you can, you know, maybe overbook or things like that. Echoing David's question too, it'd, it'd be great to also hear how you build confidence in the tools as well especially in these regulated environments um, where you need everything from document, document verification of infrastructure to change control of validation in the quality system. Um, that has been pretty good actually, because Excel, what everybody has been doing for years, it is not easy to tell when people make a change or why they did the change. And so showing change control and how you can revert in the past and exactly what the change was, why, when, it, it makes people go, oh yeah, why haven't we always done that? So there's, there's something I'm working on right now specifically because the auditability wasn't in the process. And they're like, we actually need to understand what's happening when. I was like, oh, well, we got to change out of Excel, guys. And let me show you why. And they're like, oh, yes, this is exactly what we need. And it made compliance super duper happy. Um, with your relationship with compliance. So 
I have a lot of talks regularly with compliance people. So I, like I, I've built some good relationships. So we have open conversations where we're actually teaching each other some things so we can have more common of a language. Because if you don't have that relationship, compliance and audit can be horrible. But if you can find people that you start having more of a, let's understand each other's vernacular and where we're coming from, it goes a lot easier. It is a lot of work. Like the, the way a lawyer type thinks is very different from a data scientist, very different. But the, the constant communication and camaraderie is, is useful in the long term. I agree. Yeah. Being now in a, in a data governance role, it's just, it's just painful. <laughs> they, they talk assets and, and, and we talk data objects and they're like, what? But yeah, once you bring them along, um, it's, it's really pleasant. They also build the um, confidence in what you're doing. If, if they feel like they can see transparency and, and ask you questions about feeling stupid. Yes, and I've noticed that uh, uh, in a room with more than three people, they will not speak. I yes. don't know if there's a ratio to <laughs> courage, courageousness or something, but it's definitely interesting. I, I think most people are scared of looking stupid. And like the, the title data scientist is scary to most people. So unless you can destroy that bridge, of that wall, people aren't going to talk to you. <laughs> Imbalancing, scary, um, explain a, I was just gonna say, uh, imbalancing, uh, accuracy versus explainability, depending on the uh, methodology you choose, you know, sometimes we may have to take a hit, uh, in accuracy because we can produce something that shows this is why it came up. Uh, it followed this path, you know, like a, we use a tree model over something else because I can give you a visual to say, this is why the computer did this in this way. Uh, versus something that's not, I can't give them a handout or a PowerPoint to explain the work. You just have to trust me. Yeah, definitely. And sorry, Alan, I realized that was your question. I just couldn't see your name on where I'm keeping track of all the questions. So if you want to provide any other context or feedback on that question, feel free to jump in too. Uh, yeah, I think um, I was trying to think if there was anything that I wanted to add there. I think um, so our environment has been has been changing such that there is more room and more opportunity for these kinds of things, but the industry and in particular, the folks who drive the quality system and change control at that broad organizational level, um, it's pretty hard to bring in to bring in new things and have confidence. And I've been lucky enough for a, a few years to be focused mostly in an area that didn't need to be compliant after having come from a space where I had to be super compliant all the time. And I was like, oh, great freedom. And now we're pivoting back and becoming a divisionally oriented function that is probably gonna have to figure out some of these things again. Um, and so, um, so that's an interesting place to be thinking about um, where we have enjoyed being really nimble and flexible in terms of architecture and infrastructure and how we approach things. We need to start wrapping some process around it um, again. And so, uh, so it's just on my mind a lot about how do we, how do we retain a lot of that flexibility and I think the power that comes with it while being able to demonstrate that, um, you know, our environment does what it, what we think it does, that we could demonstrate that if need be. Um, and it's going to be a negotiation that we'll have to figure out, but it, um, it's encouraging to hear that folks have been successful in those, um, in those efforts. Um, even though I know we'll have lots of details that uh, that are going to be kind of up in the air for us for a little while. Thanks. Thank you, Alice. I'm trying to uh, <laughs> scroll through to see if there's any questions that I missed so far. Um, hi, I, I'm Colin. I, I have a question. I'm, I'm just going to jump in here. Perfect. Um, and Love it. <laughs> I, I, I'm just I'm curious if you could speak to how you think about uh, the different um, data analytics projects that you tackle and how it ties to business value. Um, and I say that because I find often like I can go off on side tracks of what I think is pretty interesting and kind of go down rapid holes, but then I have to step back and be like, is this actually creating any business value? Um, so I, I just like to get your opinion on that. Like, how, how do you how do you think about 
the, the, the project that you're tackling and how it relates to creating business value. So um, it's really easy to go down those rabbit holes, but I've found works best for me and, and my team members that I've had do things is make sure that you are constantly working with the business so that you're not going too down, far down a rabbit hole that they're like, I don't care about that. That doesn't affect me at all. Where if I like, can get the business partners feeling like it's their project, and they're right beside you, like helping through it, that, that decreases the rabbit holes. It's still easy, but um, I think we all have a tendency to be like, well, that's an interesting problem. Let's go look at it. But if you have that consistent relationship with the business person where you are, are truly working together and it's not just, okay, data scientists, go do your thing and then come back when you're done. That's when I think the rabbit hole problem gets bad and there's a tendency for I think both sides to be like well I'm busy in the business so you just come back to me later and that and that as the data scientist I think you just cannot you can't go for that like I require if I'm doing work with you or for you you have to be my partner otherwise it's not going to succeed I don't know if that helps you But I, I, I have noticed I, people don't spend enough time creating that relationship and enforcing that relationship. What was that? Sorry. I said that, no, that, that makes total sense. Um, yeah, I've, de I've definitely had experience of putting in, you know, hours and hours on analysis and then, you know, the business is like, cool, <laughs> but I don't know if they're using it or, um, you know, what, what exactly is happening with it. So it's hard to say if that was even worthwhile. Yeah, I've seen- Oh, go ahead. Sorry, maybe I can jump in. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, and what you said before about the talking with the people in compliance, uh, I think was really relevant here also, because I think it's uh, oftentimes this communications issue. And one thing that I found is that people will ask how to do something and um, I will show them and maybe I'll spend half an hour or even more uh, doing literally word for word what they asked for. And then I would give them this beautiful, I'd be so proud of myself that we came up with this beautiful solution. And they'll be like, well, that's not, that's not what it was. And I'm like, that, that's, li that's literally word for word what you asked for. And they'll be like, yeah, but no, what I mean was this. And then I realized that I didn't really get what they really, really wanted. So I think oftentimes in that relevance, or what is it really useful? Is it really gonna help the business? Is really asking them what, like, what do you really want to do? Like, why do you need this number? What is really the goal? And then you maybe you can better help them really understand, okay, like, what are we gonna do to have the really maximum ROI? And that's something else that I really talk to my, my students about. What is, what is the minimal thing, that's the easiest, smallest thing you can do that can have the greatest impact on your work and on your life and, and make things easier? And then focus on that, like the 80-20 the rule, basically. And then they kind of start seeing things about, in, in kind of a different way, like, am I really doing something that's valuable? Is it really something that's gonna have a huge ROI? And then they're a little bit more convinced to go about that. But that's a lot of communication I find. Yeah, that, I think that's a common theme that keeps coming up too, is communication with business. Like understanding how to communicate so that it's relevant to them. And that the, I find that at least for me, the objective is to make them feel ownership. If I can get that ownership where it's like their baby and they care about the success or failure, that's the key. They're like, cool, it's your idea, then we're good. That's a great point. I feel like that came up on a few of the past uh, yeah. conversations as well. Like how do you kind of make sure that you're working closely enough with the business so that they feel that it's, it's their project too? Yeah, Tori, yeah. if I could uh, follow up on that. What does that look like tactically for but you? Working with the business? Yeah, like, you know, communicating, getting them on board. Oh, man, I spent so much time. Um, so for this current position, I actually created a whole vision, which then I had to go evangelize. And then I, you, like, I had to get top level support where it was the executives, all the executives were like, yes, we agree. And so I said, okay, if these are the projects you need, who is responsible, like who is my point person 
that has the flexibility to take the time to be with me. You have to tell them that like, this is important, not just to me, but to you as the boss and the executive leadership. Um, then it's been a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations, but like I try to make it not just about the data science part. I think a lot of the communication to build that relationship to get the ownership is really understanding what are the real underlying business problems. Because a lot of people will be like, they think problem A is their problem, but it's not. And only during a lot of conversation and really understanding and feeling their pain, do you understand what the real problem is? And that is what you got to kind of suss out it makes the relationship good. And like people feel heard if you actually are understanding the real problem. Does that kind of answer your question, Rob? Okay. <laughs> Thumbs up. In, for in, um, <laughs> well, one last share before I need to drop off. The way, the way I, I oper operationalized this was during the engagement process, we're doing a licitation and, and I would ask the, the leaders that were asking for the work for a co-pilot. And this person was going to share and learn and you know we share they share business we share tech and eventually they take over the analytics so it can keep surviving mm -hmm. so if they didn't upfront commit to a co-pilot to do the switch when the project was almost done that told me that they were really not that interested they're just kicking tires and we really yeah. never really engaged with them something that i've also found that helps build the relationships and helps the business take ownership is when you're presenting, have them do it. That really makes people feel ownership and proud. And then they, they care, particularly if they're presenting, like, and then they feel cool, which is great. So. Tori, I see Rick has a, a follow-up question to what you just shared. And Rick, do you want to jump in and share that? <clears throat> Sure. Uh, I, I put in the in the chat. The question was when you mentioned this thing about the, getting them the, to come up with the real problem, uh, which is, I, I'm also kind of doing that. The question I was, do you document that somehow? Like, do you have um, like a protocol where we state what the problem is, and then we take the steps, and then there's kind of a uh, that we can see the progression of how we went from the original problem to the the so-called real problem, which is interesting in itself to understand how that process worked and you can show people how that worked and then also the other one is it kind of covers covers yourself because you can kind of show whoever like well that like it's on paper like that that's what we said we were gonna do and we did it so that people don't come back afterwards and say mm, it wasn't did you have um, some kind of a strategy for doing that so in the past because where i am now it's so new i've not been as good at documenting that whole process flow previously um yes i like for each project or working with somebody, we'd start out with saying, this is the objective and where we're going. And we basically have minutes and notes that would just tack on. Mm -hmm. Not that fancy. So just, just like, like just um, note meetings, like the notes from the meeting. It wasn't basically. Uh, like a standard. Not really. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, like sometimes um, there's more of a structured uh, document, you know, in, in some protocols, like if I'm going to do an experiment, there's a clear, this is the input, this is what the, what the reagent was this is the incubation like this all the little pieces inside and then you have the results and then you can make a clear direction between the results and the conditions of the experiment and so i would kind of think of something like that for um instead of just like this kind of unstructured media notes which um leave a lot to subjective people's writing for what what they want and also interpretation more of like a clear like um okay this is the goal of the project this is the variables these are the data sets this is the mm -hmm. main question and then this is what each of the variables mean these are the problems with each of the variables these are the techniques that are recommended the pros and the cons and then a little bit more of a cleared outline in that way do you think that's worthwhile oh, or yes possible? so by the point at um you're actually producing some output yes but like okay. to get to that output there is so much iteration beforehand that a lot of the findings, they're documented, but not as strictly as by like final outputs. Like here are the iterations. This is what we've tried. This is why we didn't use this variable. Sorry, I thought you were thinking more of in the discussions of trying to suss out what the real problem is. 
I've found that's a lot messier, at least for me. I wish I could come up with a stricter, but I, I think I'm, I'm not as clear cut as I probably should be in that part. It gets easier, I think, once you start swapping out variables and being like, oh, no, this didn't work. Let's document it. That kind of makes sense. Yeah, OK. Clearly, I should work on that a bit. I know we're getting to the top of the hour here, and a few people have to jump off. But um, happy to stay on for any other questions that we haven't had a chance to answer yet. Um, I know there's one question from earlier that actually kind of touches on a few of the, the earlier points around building the community and training, um, but touches upon like why now, like why is your team starting to make this change, whether it's from SAS to Excel and moving over to R and Python, like what has been the, the key driver there? For me? Or... Yeah, for you. So, can, can I also jump in for, you know, when, uh, for about one minute? So uh, actually from, a, you know, the other side of the table and the last few years I've been teaching R for, you know, building students. And I think the, the main challenge is to how to get students on board. And I, I also teach, you know, Tableau. And I think uh, in comparison, I think R is more user friendly. And then Tableau is like, you know, a different Excel. So for me, and you know, still most most students would pre, pre, prefer to use Tableau because you know they, they thought you know maybe it's more popular. Um, I I tell them you know the truth is that you know if you learn R or Python, there are more jobs available. And then you know I think a Tableau probably did something which you know which could help them grow, you know their popularity, you know in the business community and also in you know in academia. So primarily, I think they introduced um you know, uh, university ambassadors uh, to university students. So let's say if you are good at using Tableau, if you are proficient, maybe, you know, they'll give you a title, okay, this student is a Tableau ambassador, and then they send their um, portfolio to, you know, the, the company, and then they apply to be ambassadors, and then they can organize, you know, I mean, meetups or even, I mean, let's say R has been such a great language in which I benefit personally and professionally. Uh, I would say, you know, maybe, in the future, if you can organize more data analytics, you know, competitions for students are probably meetups are probably, you know, you know, this kind of recognitions. So, I mean, the next generation students that could benefit from these skills. Otherwise, then when they graduate, they only have Excel or SPSS, which, you know, I mean, SPS probably nobody wants to use it, you know, from a company, but majority of professors still teach. SPSS. I, I understand maybe a few years ago when I started teaching R, um, the, I had maybe less than five students who picked up the R programming language. And uh, at the end of the semester, he told me that, you know, he was working for a banking company. And he said, you know, he was using sentiment analysis to analyze, you know, customer, you know, customer complaints. The first time ever. And mm -hmm. he's a, he has a you know engineering background, so majority of students do not have that you know background to understand how R works. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point, Jimmy. Is Tori? Is that something that um, Wafed Bank does for internships or like maybe data competitions? I know on like the sports analytics meetup, we talked a little bit about like the big data bowl, and that's how they find a lot of um, people for new positions. So. Um, we are in a, our absolute infancy, so no. Yeah. <laughs> Previously, one of the things that I found useful, not where I am, but um, my prior bank, we did a lot with the local university, which was awesome. Like it started building a relationship between like the data scientists at the bank and the university, and it helped drive actually what the university was teaching and found some hires there, that was awesome. But the issue with banking is so many of the universities are like, can we get an actual data set? Because real data versus the stuff we have is, they're not comparable, right? Real data is so much messier and harder than the lovely like Iris data set. And so people come out of college and they don't actually know how to, how to, really deal with problems in the data set. 
So I, I've yet to figure out how to get something like that going. I, I know there are a few banks that have been able to create, get, get their compliance okay to let people have some competitions with their data, which I think would be awesome. I have not yet figured out how to do that. I don't think I see any other questions in the chat, but one other question that I, I'd love to ask Tori is, do you have any advice for people who are on or maybe aspiring data science leaders for getting into leadership roles? Into a leadership role, I think it has to do with partnerships with the businesses and communication. I've noticed the people that are able to speak the language of the business people are the ones that do the best. Um, I know it's fun to talk about the statistics and the, the fun modeling that you go into, but that does not generally make an executive go, wow, they care about the dollars. And if you're able to relate things back to how it affects the business and the bottom line and speak that language, those are the what those are the people that generally get picked to start presenting and to talking with other leaders because they can actually communicate and understand what you're saying. So there's it's it's a lot of work to understand the business and to be able to speak both like mathy nerd and business, but that's really the key. Thank you, Tori. Yeah, it seems like so much of it really goes back to the communication piece. Yeah. Well, I know we're a little bit over on our original uh, time and I don't see any other questions. But I just wanna say thank you so much, Tori, for sharing your insights oh, thank with you. us and, and your experience. And thank you all for joining as well. Um, Tori, quick question. If people wanna get in contact with you, what's the best way? Um probably my Gmail. Here, I'll type it. You can try LinkedIn. I'm just not good in social media. I will check it eventually. <laughs> there we go. Awesome. Thank you, Tori. And thank, thank you, you so much, everyone, for joining. Hopefully, we'll see you next week, same oh, time. Can, can I ask a quick question for people who are still here? Something yeah. I was thinking about that has been driving me crazy just about data science is like, I wish there were, I'm frustrated that there is a lack of a professional certification organization. So this runs into a couple of different things. Like one of the issues I see where data science fails is because there is bad analysis. Like people aren't actually able to produce something because they don't have the, the basic skills that they need. But then people that want to actually understand that they have the skills and can tout it have a harder time of doing that. And I was like, man, the, these societies exist for like every other profession. So you've got accountants becoming CPAs, you have financial analysts, like the good ones are CFAs. The, sorry, I'm saying all acronyms, right? I'm chartered financial analysts, lawyers, they have the bar. Everybody in all these other professions have some kind of professional organization, but we don't as data scientists. And so like a lot of people trying to become a data scientist, they don't have an understanding of what the minimum requirements are, which I think would be useful for them. I'm curious if this is a sentiment that other people have, or if I'm just going crazy. I'm like, maybe JJ can, can fix in? this one, Rachel. Oh. <laughs> yeah, what's up? <laughs> Um, I mean, one, one of the things that all those professions or most of them have in common is their, their protected names. So you can't call yourself a doctor, you can't call yourself a lawyer or an accountant, unless you have that. And, and those are names that are regulated and protected. So if you call yourself a doctor and you don't have that, then, then you're screwed. And so um, in one sense, I, I don't think data scientists would be ever a, a protected name because scientists is not right. I'm a biologist. That's true. But, you know, because I have, I have a doctor title, but a lot of people that don't have a doctor title call themselves a biologist. And I disagree with that, but I can't, I can't um, say, say anything to them. Um, and I, so I think science as a, in general is not really a protected, um, a protect, protected name that people can have. Uh, but I also wanted to mention, um, uh, based on that, there is this um, 
Uh, do you know the DAMA, uh, the Data Management um, Organization? I'm going to send you, I'll put in the, oh, in the chat. So this is the only one that I ever found because I got a task to do a data management um, um, a proposal and that I, I disappeared into the ether. So I don't know what happened with it. But because of that, I did a lot of research into these guys. And this is the only one that, and they're certified, they're schools that they, that they pen out. And it seems to be the only, for me, it was the only one, maybe other people in the class, in the group know other ones. So it seemed to be the only quasi- widely recognized certification in the field, although every, everybody and their brothers got a different cert certification program. Um, and there are schools that they will, they will certify, you can do the certification for us. And I have seen people ask for it. So as data management becomes more popular, this is, this is being asked for on um, job, job prof profiles, but it's not specific for actually doing data science itself, but it's something related. Okay. The one thing that has been frustrating for me is going through, I feel like a lot of people will take one course and like on Coursera and they're like, I'm a data scientist. I'm like, hold up. There are like some fundamentals you need to understand. Like, key hacking is a problem. Do you actually under basic, understand basic statistics? Anyway. I'm, I, I get really frustrated as well. I'm sure you're sensitive. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll check that out. Thank you. It's a great point, though, Tori, especially as people talk about reproducibility crisis and all of that, that there is the fact that there is no real certification there. Yeah. I was gonna, I, yeah, go ahead, Tori. Go. Oh, no, go ahead. No, I was going to ask, actually, you were talking, this is sort of the technical skills, you know, do they have the stats and that the understanding of the certification around that, but you were talking earlier about the business communication or business understanding and communication. I'm just wondering how do you, I don't know, is that a hiring thing? Like, what is that? How do you make sure you get people that not only do they know how to do the, the data science piece, but they have the business piece as well? When I'm hiring? Oh, or just if you're inherited, you're building a team, but if you have yeah. it already. Oh, when I've, when I've inherited teams, it becomes pretty clear who is interested in, in owning and, and really thinking. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't like to think. They generally leave if the expectations are, are high and, and their peers don't feel like they're pursuing it. Are you asking if, how do I make sure a new hire has those softer skills? Well, I guess what I'm wondering is if that's a critical component of the success of the team how do you um, make sure that the team has those skills? Hiring seems to be an obvious place, but if you already have a team, I guess what you're doing is you're setting expectations and they weed themselves out. That, that does work actually. Um, for the statistics and understanding what they're doing, I feel like that is an absolute fundamental. If you can't talk to somebody, that's a different problem. But if you're making just bad analysis, it's gonna destroy the team. The credibility is gone. Um, my previous team, there was a range of who liked to do what. And because the, the technical skills were all solid, not everybody wants to talk to the business. So the people that actually were good at it could take that role. Mm -hmm. and, and in hiring, every time we we're up to get a new person, like the team would actually get together being like, what? qualities are we lacking as a team? So what do we need to really focus on to make sure this person is adding that value to our team? I don't think everybody is the same. I think you have, like you rely on each other. That's when it become powerful. So. Have you ever seen like a project manager taking that kind of role, like the communication with the business or is it usually someone from the team that wants to do that? Or? My experience of project managers is not awesome. I've had, I've had one that I really liked because, and I'm sure there are some great ones. My, it's not that big, but we would just take on project management ourselves because mm -hmm. generally the project managers we had would turn more into task managers and not understand really the intricacies. Like I think, not that long ago, somebody brought up their frustration with Scrum and um, like the whole, now we're doing stand-up meetings and it's 
it doesn't seem to be working for data science. And I, I get that completely because data science and building a software product are so different, but everybody assumes the same. And I, like, it feels to me like project management is generally more on a, this is the dedicated timeline and you're going to hit that. And that's not really data science. So I have not found project managers that useful. It, the one exception is they often will know more people initially at a company so they can help connect you with the person but for communication I or can i can useful. i ask on the on the product managers and the scrum do you think because this was a, a big conversation for a while that data science cannot be done in an agile way and it just because like what you said it just doesn't work that way but there's a, there's a lot of people who argue that actually, yeah, it can work in that way. And that um, also it comes back to this topic that we mentioned before. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence. I'm, it doesn't matter either way. But uh, some, like what we mentioned before, this like reiteration and communication coming back and back. And actually that would fit well with, with this, uh, these kind of sprints and then having a clear result and then checking in, are we going in the right direction? And then, so some people argue that actually it does work quite well. I think it can work well. I think people try to shove data science into how they do, um, how they create a software product. And it, yeah, it's yeah. that I mean, shoving it into really the box, it doesn't work. And like data yeah. science, if we not, aren't actually agile, if we're not failing fast and making sure what we're doing still makes sense, we'll fail. And it, it, yeah. what frustrates me is I'm like, hold on, the idea of agility isn't scrum. Mm. And I, it seems okay. like people like cross those wires and like, yeah, you want to fail fast. Let's yeah. make sure we're doing things that are reasonable and not like going down a rabbit hole and not talking to somebody for a month. Yeah. But the timeline thing can be tricky. And I'm not, I'm not sure about all that either. I, I still kind of prefer Kanban boards to a, the current scrum. I don't know. I'm on the fence too. Rob. B, I see you unmuted yourself. Did you have a final question? <laughs> yeah, uh, and thanks again for doing this, Tori. Um, there's, there's, so there's business skills. Um, and then I guess one, one level deeper is there's industry level skills. Um, like, so, you know, understanding, like you're a data scientist at a financial services company, you understand finance is, is that on the sort of critical path for a, a hire on your team or in your organization no um so when i look at hires i care if they can think logically i do not care if they even have programming or if they understand the industry i care about the way they think because i'm like okay if if you think logically like hopefully they have programming most people now that are applying have programming, but I can teach banking. I cannot teach logic. Like if you don't think that way, that's not gonna work. But banking, I can teach. Like a, a discount cash flow, why bankers do think the way they are, that's simple compared to what I expect from a budding data scientist. So no, like my last team, I don't think. There was one person I hired internally. Everybody else had, um, like, they came from oceanography, physics, math, and none of them were banking. And I actually found that really helpful because people see problems differently when they come from different industries. It's more of how do you tackle a problem? When you interview, how do you test for that skill? Can they think logically? Um, I do actually use tests. So like we do have the regular talking through people, but um, so I, I usually give a couple different tests. One is a take home, like you have X amount of hours and here's some data, do something with it, give me a report. And it's really open-ended. I found, so there's not like a way, like there's so many ways you can solve it correctly the wrong answers are just blatant. It, it's just obvious. The other thing that I'd, I don't know how to, we've been doing it over online and it's weird to do it online, but 
it's nice to have somebody actually come in and try to do something live without internet. And be like, okay, here's a computer if you want. Um, here is your task you have to solve, go for it. And I don't really care if they solve it. I want to see how they go about it. So I had one guy that could not, for the life of him, remember the package. I think he chose to use Python. He was like, I don't care what programming language you do, you have this task. And he could not remember how to run a regression. So on pen and paper, he did the entire, he like figured it all out and then used his own algorithm and implemented it. And I was like, he was one of the best hires I've ever hired. Like it, it was, it was beautiful. Anyway, it's, I try to pinpoint what are the skills and the thinking that I want to see? Can you demonstrate that? Or because what I really want to avoid is the people that will be like, I'm going to throw all this data and use like a convolutional neural network to solve something that really could be done with regular expression. Because I've seen this, like, and that's what I don't want, which is, it, it's really obvious with some simple tasks. Anyway. Yeah, that's great. Do you ever ask them, because you touched on it before, you know, asking them to explain it to someone what they just did. And mm -hmm. if you then get people talking about is the model and you know that piece as opposed to the value do you test yeah. that as well yeah yeah when um played around with a couple of things when somebody is doing like a live coding or a live it's more of a can you explain your thought process as you're going through this which is really enlightening mm -hmm. i find it useful to see what type of questions people ask or if like how how much will they persist how much understanding are they trying to dig? Which is, that sounds subjective, but it is, it becomes very apparent. Going off of Robert's question though, um, do, you, do you find a lot of hires that do think logically, but really only when it comes to the data science aspect and in the process of teaching them the banking and the business side? Um, I guess a lot of these questions around what is the value of these things connecting with the business partners? I, I think I was thinking what Robert was is, you know, it might be helpful to find people who already have that sense of why this is valuable to the business. And it sounds like you're, you're more confident in your ability to just train them to do that. And you want them to have those core skills instead. Um, what is my question here? Uh, what, you know, what is training them on the business look like uh, to you? Um, so I always force people to actually have serious partnerships, but I think I understand your question because I've had a few employees where they get so excited about the modeling that they forget that actually we have to like make value or there is no reason that we exist. We're just becoming an expense. So I've had to have those conversations before. I know this is exciting, but there is a balance between figuring out a really cool way of doing this and giving real value without taking too much time. And those are, those are conversations and depending on the person, th there are just people that would love to be in academia but are not. <laughs> so some of the PhD, PhDs I have I've had a more of that with. And I think that's just because like you've been in school forever. That is what you do. So, but, oh, you know what? I had one other thought because we're still talking. Um, getting people to present their results is useful, but I've had to coach multiple people being like, okay, remember who's in the audience. You're talking to the CEO. Is he going to care about this? No. He cares about his financials showing this, this, and this. So how can you relate this back? Instead of spoon feeding it though, like you gotta get them to actually understand how to do that, which takes time. So I do have a meeting in like five minutes, but <laughs> I, I have to say I'm rating the like <laughs> appropriate amount to see if someone else jumped in but thank you so much tori and thank you to thank everyone you guys this is fun this is a great great session i hope to see you next week too